Good morning, everyone. Welcome all of you joining the public presentation organized by the Occupational Health Center. Today, the topic is about the COVID-19 and the talk on workers' mental health. We are so pleased to have John Odak. He is the occupational hygienist from the Occupational Health Center for Ontario Workers from OCAG. So John has since joining as OCAG since 1989. He is also a, a chemical engineer originally. He was a part-time assistant professor in the McMaster University Department of the Health Research Methods, Evidence and Impact. He is certified with the Canadian Registration Board for Occupational Hygienists and the American Board of Industrial Hygiene. John has done on-site exposure investigation and conduct extensive surveys of healthcare and other workers, and been a member of the research team investigating infection transmission. And also John has done extensive work about stressors, mental injuries, including the stress access materials available through OCAL and the Canadian Center for Occupational Health and Safety. So we would like to begin by acknowledge that we are on Treaty 1 territory, the traditional territories of the Anishinaabeg, Greek, OG Greek, Dakotas, and Dene's peoples, and the homelands of Native Nation. We respect the treaties that we were made on these territories, and we acknowledge that we are all treaty people. At the Occupational Health Center, we commit ourselves to a process of reconciliation with Indigenous communities. So for the audience participation and follow up, please put your question on the chat box area on the right side of the screen. We have the Q&A session. We're going to answer it forward after. And please follow us uh, if we are not able to answer all the questions for you. And this event is being recorded for review later and share on the social media. And also please participate in the follow-up evaluation survey, giving us some feedback for upcoming event. So the Occupational Health Center is a community health center funded by the Winnipeg Regional Health Authorities. And we are now uh, located on 167 Sherbrooke Street, Winnipeg, Manitoba. So we provide the services to the Manitoba workers with work-related health issues and work closely with the John Workplace Health and Safety Committees for training. Our service is no charge. And please visit our website for more information and the resources. Now, please join me to welcome John. Thank you, Tiffany. Okay, here we go. I want to thank you all for joining us uh, to talk about mental health and the toll that COVID-19 is having uh, on workers in workplaces. Um, I, I also want to uh, recognize that there are a lot of uh, people of Ukrainian descent in Manitoba and our thoughts are with you and your your relatives or your friends uh, in this tr troubling time. Uh, Tiffany just described what the Manitoba Occupational Health Center is about so I'll give a brief description of what our sister clinics in Ontario are like um, the Manitoba one was established before uh, the ones in Ontario. So we used your center as a model back then. But uh, similarly, we're an interdisciplinary team. We have doctors, nurses, ergonomists, hygienists, community organizers, customer service coordinators, and leadership and administration. We're funded by the our provincial Ministry of Labor through their prevention branch. And our board of directors uh, comes from organized labor. I also want to recognize Peter Smith from the Institute of Work and Health who helped us in uh, doing the surveys that we'll be talking about. Uh, Peter did the statistics and wrote up the papers uh, that we'll be mentioning. The paper I want to start with was one that was put out uh, by the Public Health Agency of Canada in their, uh, their journal. And uh, I believe it's also um, people from Statistics Canada. And uh, 
it's it's a discussion of the uh, symptoms of major depressive disorder or MDD during COVID. And uh, they took a representative sample of the Canadian population and they followed them not only during COVID, but they also referred to um, surveys that were done before COVID. So they were looking for protective factors, things that could uh, prevent uh, major depressive disorders. And they had this list here, a sense of belonging to a community, a sense of mastery, uh, how much control you feel you have over your life circumstances. Some of the coping me mechanisms people have to uh, deal with uh, stressors in their life, uh, communicating, connecting with friends and family, meditating, uh, praying or seeking spiritual guidance, exercising outdoors, exercising indoors, changing food choices, participating in hobbies and change in sleep patterns. And uh, what they found was mastery and community belonging were strongly protective against um, depressive disorders, as was exercising both indoors and outdoors. They combined these two into a single factor. Uh, participating in hobbies was protective. However, um, changing sleep patterns changing food choices and meditating were actually associated with more uh, major depressive disorder symptoms. And the reason they gave for that is they thought that when people are experiencing uh, depression, they start changing their food choices, their sleep patterns start changing, they perhaps do some meditation in order to counteract uh, the symptoms to try to control them. And so uh, they suggested that these strategies were used to combat their depressive symptoms rather than cause them. So the risk factors they found that were the strongest was uh, listed here, and I'll rearrange them with the in order of their odds ratios. Uh, the biggest factor was physical health problems, feelings of loneliness or isolation was next, challenges in personal relationships with uh, members of your household, a change in the use of cannabis, and uh, difficulty meeting financial obligations or essential needs, concern about violence in your home, change in alcohol, consumption, death in a family member, friend or colleague, and loss of job or income. The ones with the red asterisks are, um, again, uh, thought to be perhaps self-medicating uh, and therefore uh, can be related to the fact that you do have a major depressive order and they may be a result rather than a cause or a risk factor. Now, when you look at this list, uh, what is missing? Well, first of all, um, when we look at mental harm prevention, uh, this is a theoretical framework we work with. Um, we have three prevention levels, primary prevention, secondary prevention, and tertiary prevention. For those of you familiar with health and safety lingo, this is roughly equivalent to at the source, along the path, and at the worker. And for the individual worker, um, at at the worker, tertiary prevention, you're dealing with people who have major depressive orders and need uh, therapy, counseling, medication, and support. Um, secondary prevention is catching it before it becomes debilitating, and therefore you're trying to uh, catch the early symptoms and give people uh, instruction on relaxation techniques such as mindfulness, an emphasis on well wellness. Uh, eating well, sleeping, etc. Primary prevention is often about uh, changing the way you think and the way you approach you. Uh, stress in the workplace, coping and appraisal skills. Uh, you hear a lot of resiliency and support at this level. And if we look at the uh, Public Health Agency of Canada study, uh, 
They had mastery and community belonging, exercising and hobbies, and changing food choices, sleep patterns, and meditation as negative outcomes of uh, depression, which was uh, ways of coping. And if you place them into this matrix, uh, you'll see that it all falls under individual factors. So what's missing from this study is looking at the workplace. Uh, what are the things that can be done in the workplace that can uh, avoid major depressive dis symptoms? So this is what's missing. So this is a, another study that we did. Uh, we, we looked uh, at the beginning of COVID. Um, uh, we were working with unions trying to provide them with information on how to uh, protect themselves and their, and their colleagues uh, from infection and uh, dealing with a lot of questions. And so we saw from the literature that in China, um, healthcare workers uh, there were studies done that showed that healthcare workers were having a strong effect on their mental health. So um, we decided to put together a survey with the unions and we crowdsourced it uh, through union commu communications and networks. And we had over 5,400 uh, completed uh, surveys that we analyzed from April 4th to mid-May of 2020 during the first wave and these were people from all over Canada including Manitoba and then while we were doing that survey someone said well let's also look at the non-healthcare workers so we created a second survey and that went out a little later and we had almost 4,000 uh, completed responses uh, from them and so we had these two first wave surveys. We kept this survey open and it's still open actually. And uh, so what I'm gonna to present to you is some of the second wave results. And what you see in the second wave is a, a lot lower response. Uh, we only had just over 700 healthcare workers and uh, about 1800 uh, non-healthcare workers. It was available in English and French too. So one of the questions we asked was, how would you rate your current level of fear about this whole pandemic situation? And during the second wave, the average healthcare score on this scale was 6.4. And you'll see though, even though that's the average, you see this big bump on 10, which was as much fear as I have ever felt. 11% of the respondents uh, indicated that they were feeling that. For a non-healthcare worker, it was less than half of that. Uh, and their average score is 5.9. And if we compare that to the first wave, um, the healthcare uh, average went down a, a bit, which is a good thing. But the non-healthcare actually went up uh, 0.3 points. We also asked a question about how concerned are you about bringing this virus home to those you live with or your, and or your friends. Healthcare uh, workers in the second wave uh, had an average of 3.6, but you can see 38% were extremely concerned. And for non-healthcare workers, it was 28% uh, that were extremely concerned. Again, comparing that to the first wave, um, the healthcare workers, um, the level of concern went down slightly. And for non-healthcare workers, it went up slightly. We also used the Copenhagen Psychosocial Questionnaire to measure certain uh, psychosocial scales. Uh, we didn't dare ask uh, the healthcare workers about quantitative demands in the middle of a pandemic. Um, However, for non-healthcare workers, you can see a, a score of 50 was about five points higher than it was prior to the pandemic. Work pace uh, for healthcare workers was very high, 71, uh, which is 10 points higher. Uh, for non-healthcare workers, it was lower, which uh, makes some sense because people working at home uh, were actually finding that without the commute, they had uh, 
more time to do their work and less uh, stress unless they had uh, kids at home that were had to be uh, taught or other people cared for. Predictability, which is about um, knowing what's going on. Prior to the pandemic, uh, the average Canadian score was 54, and for healthcare workers, it was quite a bit lower, uh, 43. It was also lower for non-healthcare workers. Role conflicts uh, were about the same. Uh, anything between three and five points is where you start to see a significant difference. So less than um, a difference of less than three is, is not really that important. Supervisor support, uh, again, for healthcare it was uh, lower than prior to the pandemic and also for non-healthcare. Colleague support was up and, uh, you know, stands the reason when you're in a crisis, you, you need to draw on your colleagues uh, for support. Uh, family support was a new question that isn't in the Copenhagen Psychosocial Questionnaire, but we asked that and looks like uh, healthcare had a slightly more than non-healthcare. Burnout symptoms were very high compared to uh, prior to the pandemic and uh, sleep symptoms also for, uh, for both. Now, when we compare them to the first wave, uh, things are fairly similar. Uh, the colleague support slipped a little uh, from the first wave to the second wave, but the burnout symptoms did increase significantly from the, and so did the sleep symptoms for healthcare workers. Uh, for non-healthcare workers, again, it stayed roughly the same, uh, except you do see uh, a bit of a jump in burnout symptoms, sleep symptoms, uh, non-significant uh, elevation but still much higher than prior to the pandemic. And we also asked questions about protective equipment and we used this scale as to whether your needs were being met, which means you had the appropriate type and you had an adequate supply. And then all the way down to not needed or needed, but not available. Uh, and uh, so these are a graded scale and this was for a whole list of different types of protective equipment. Uh, some of them were only for non-healthcare workers. Uh, we assume, for instance, that soap and water is always available for uh, healthcare workers. And here you see the results of the healthcare workers. 20% of the respondents uh, felt that less than half their needs were being uh, met, 4.5. 4.6% uh, thought that none of their needs were being met. And when it came to non-healthcare workers, a similar percentage, uh, 18%. Now, in the first wave, uh, this was um, almost more than double. 44% uh, of healthcare workers felt that their PPE needs were not being met. And that's when we heard about shortages of masks and, and other things. And uh, similarly, for the non-healthcare workers, uh, almost double, uh, more than double uh, during the first wave. So things did improve in the second wave as to uh, perceived adequacy and supply of uh, PPE. We also asked about infection control practices, and obviously these are quite different in healthcare. Again, we use a similar scale needs being met means appropriate and adequately implemented and needs not being met was lacking for this list and for non-healthcare we had a different list uh, we had a lot more actually about staggered schedules and and things like that and again uh, the healthcare workers 39 percent uh, felt that less than half of their health um, infection control practice needs were being met. But for non-healthcare in the second wave, it was 54%, uh, more than half. And how did that compare to the first wave? Well, it was fairly similar for the healthcare workers. It improved slightly um, for the non-healthcare workers. Uh, 
it uh, it deteriorated. And I think some of that may have been that people really didn't know in the first wave what was appropriate and what wasn't. And as we learned more, uh, people realized that the workplaces were not keeping up with uh, appropriate controls. So we asked questions similar to the uh, study that I talked at the beginning uh, about, um, well, it didn't do generalized anxiety disorder, uh, GAD7, which is a screening for anxiety, but it did use the patient health questionnaire, the PHQ. We use the shortened version. They use PHQ7. We had PHQ2. And uh, the scores were uh, not at all several days, more than half the days or nearly every day for uh, questions about depression and anxiety. This uh, same scale for anxiety was also used by Statistics Canada during the first wave. And in Canada, they found 18% of people screened positive. So keep that number in mind when we're comparing. But they also found that the younger you were, the higher uh, the rate of anxiety symptoms. And also it was higher among women than in men. Now they did another study, which they used both the anxiety and the depression scales uh, in September to December, which was the second wave, which was when we also did our surveys. And there from 18%, it went down to 13% uh, in the second wave in the general population. And so if we look for healthcare workers, uh, we see um, that the rate of anxiety disorder went down a little bit, uh, went to from 55% and 49%. And similarly, for non healthcare workers, it went from 42% to 37%. But you can see this is much higher than the uh, 18 and 13% uh, in the general population. And for them, the uh, major depressive disorder symptoms, 15% of Canadians in the second wave screened positive. And for the healthcare workers, it was 40, uh, one, 42% staying relatively the same. Similarly for non-healthcare workers, it was uh, 34% uh, percent both times. So then we ask the question, is there a relationship between anxiety and depression symptoms and supplying uh, workers with their PPE and infection control practices uh, needs. And so we broke down the anxiety disorder uh, by what percentage of their personal protective equipment needs were being met. So if all your PPE needs were being met, uh, the respondents uh, screened 41% of them screen positive for anxiety. But if less than half your needs were being met or none of your needs were being met, 69% uh, screen positive for anxiety disorders. So you can see a very strong relationship there. And it was even stronger for infection control practices. And uh, this is, uh, again, among healthcare workers, 37% screen positive if all their needs were being met versus 69% if none of their needs were being met. The first wave results were similar uh, to this, and uh, they have been published in this article. And if you click on the link when you get access to the, uh, the slides, then you can, uh, you can download this. So we also looked at uh, the non healthcare workers, and we saw a similar pattern. Uh, if all your needs were being met, only 29% of uh, the respondents screened positive for anxiety, but if uh, 58 or 59% uh, of the people who had less than half or none of their PPE needs being met were screening positive. And again, uh, the similar situation for infection 
control practices. Uh, only 24 percent, well, only uh, still uh, uh, more than the Canadian average. Uh, screen positive if all their needs were met versus 59 percent. Now we also broke it down because the people who were not healthcare workers, some of them were working at home, some of them were working on site, the essential workers, and there were also people who were no longer employed. And uh, so for people working at home, 32% of them screen positive for anxiety and 43% screen positive if they were working at the site, work at the workplace. And 47% of those who were no longer employed screen positive. Now this middle group, um, the site-based, if we break this down by the proportion of their um, PPE and infection control practice needs being met, we can uh, see how this compares to these two extremes. So we have working remotely, we have not working at all, and then we have um, those whose infection control practice needs were fully met, uh, only, well, again, it's not only, it's 15% of uh, the respondents screen potters positive for anxiety, which is similar to the Canadian average that stats can found. But 64%, if none of your needs were being met, and 55% if less than half. And you can see that if you're working on site and your needs are not being met very well, uh, it's worse than the anxiety that people are experiencing in the survey who were not working at all. What surprised us was compared to people working at home, you know, who don't have to worry about uh, infections uh, coming into the home the way you do at the workplace. Work, working with all your infection control needs uh, being met was much better than uh, working at home for anxiety symptoms. And uh, that kind of surprised us. We thought that this would be the uh, working remotely would be uh, the lowest level of anxiety. But uh, the least was if you go to work and all your uh, infection control practice needs were being met, it was better. This was similar to our first uh, survey. And uh, the first survey, uh, first wave survey was uh, published. And again, you can access it through this link. So the bottom line was that while individual risk factors are important in preventing anxiety and depressive symptoms, workplace factors are also uh, important, such as uh, meeting a person's needs, perceived needs of personal protective equipment and infection control practices. So that means uh, that providing adequate workplace protections is a way of preserving workers' mental health. And I don't think we've thought of that in the past that way. We, we tend to split the physical and the mental into two compartments and uh, kind of ignore the overlap. And a lot of the discussion in Canada has been about uh, mental health in the recent uh, years, and especially during uh, the pandemic, but it's focused on individuals. So, uh, there's a lot of talk about stigma and vulnerability. And you see here in the middle, you know, be kind. But really, in the middle of a pandemic, when tempers are flaring, as we saw with the uh, truckers' uh, protests, uh, being kind it can be uh, quite difficult in, in tough circumstances. The Canadian standard uh, Z1003 uh, psychological health and safety in the workplace, uh, when it was being written, they uh, used, they took out all the words psychosocial and replaced them with psychological. And this is a fairly important difference uh, that you, sh that's, uh, you should take note of because in psychology, uh, the perspective is that everything 
important is what's going on in a person's inside a person's head between your ears. Um, and so if the problem is inside your head, then the solution is inside your head and you need to change the way you think, the way you manage your stress and, and things like that. However, uh, another perspective on dealing with uh, mental health in the workplace is the psychosocial approach, which focuses not only on what's going on in the person's own mind, but what's going on in other minds and how those other minds are interacting in an environment. And is that environment uh, beneficial or harmful uh, to the individual's mental health? And it's kind of like the old adage that if all you have is a hammer, then all your problems look like nails. So if you look at it as a personal issue, uh, then the types of solutions are stigma reduction, self-care, coping, mindfulness, cognitive behavior therapy, and resiliency. And these are good things, but in isolation from the social environment, uh, you can be placing all the burden on the individual without dealing with some of the causes that are external to the individual. Mental Health First Aid is uh, an excellent program. I've taken it myself. It's a two-day course that teaches you, um, educates you about the different disorders and what you can do, not being a psychologist, but just being a, a concerned co-worker, how you can uh, support people who are going through these difficulties. However, again, um, first aid is great, um, but if you have a workplace that has a high rate of accidents, is the solution to train more people in first aid? So this was uh, kind of what uh, Dr. David Posen, who's a doctor in Ontario, who had a family practice, and he had a counseling service. So. Um, people in the Oakville area were coming to him and they were complaining of stress. And, and so um, he wrote a little book, Staying Afloat When the Water Gets Rough. And uh, he changed the, uh, the uh, cover uh, because here the water doesn't look very rough. So he had a more uh, rough water uh, cover for the, the book when it came out in the second edition. And he also put out uh, a, a little book about stress relief. So, you know, he was counseling his patients to uh, manage their, their, uh, their stress levels and relax and deal with it. Uh, but what he found out was uh, people were doing what the books were telling them to do, but they were still coming back stressed. So then he started looking at the workplace and he put out another book, uh, which is called Is Work Killing You? A Doctor's Prescription for Treating Workplace Stress. And it's uh, quite enlightening to, to hear his experience in, in dealing with these um, patients of his. And in the book, he says, uh, there are two ways to reduce stress. One is to get rid of what's there, exercise, meditation, relaxation, and massage, medications such as tranquilizers, diversion and distraction, humor, laughter, and all and play can all be helpful. However, if you don't eliminate the source of the stress, overwhelming workload, unrealistic deadlines, a difficult boss, you can jog and eat broccoli till the cows come home and you won't get ahead of the problem. The stress will keep accumulating as fast as you can dissipate it. The best way to deal with stress is to get rid of what's there and eliminate the source. And he also says about his uh, other books, the first book ran the risk of being seen as blaming the victim, although fortunately no one took it that way. This book runs the risk of blaming the organization for all the stress. The truth is somewhere in the middle. It's a shared responsibility. But I have observed that an increasing amount of stress in recent years has been company driven and organizations are doing precious little to own up to the damage they're causing on a daily basis. And so he has lots of recommendations in the book. Uh, one of the recommendations which now has been uh, enacted in Ontario is 
workplaces have to talk about the right to turn off uh, their cell phones and their emails and that at the end of the week. So looking at it again from the prevention framework, the primary, secondary and tertiary prevention, we talked about the individual focus and also the organizational focus, but we can flesh this out even more. Between the individual and the organizational, we also have the group. You know, some organizations can have great policies and everything, but where these policies get operationalized is at the group level in the department, the shift or the team. And uh, it, it can be the same as the organizational, but it's more personal. It's uh, where the rubber hits the road. So you can have a nice piece of paper that hangs on the wall, but the way we implement it gets flushed out in the group level. And sometimes you can have a group that uh, works well together. It's a great team. They support each other and everything. But the policy of the organization is not supportive. But in spite of that, they're able to pull together and, and get through. The reverse can be true, too. You might have a great policy that hangs on the wall there. And everyone who walks in uh, admires it. But the way it gets operationalized can be a disaster. Uh, they're not really following, it's just wallpaper. There's also other uh, levels, the economic sector, uh, you know, healthcare has different challenges than corrections, for instance, or construction. And there's also this societal level. And I think we've had lots of support for uh, the focus on mental health at the societal level. But as I have mentioned, it seems to be very personal. Uh, individually focused. So here are some tools uh, that we've put together on our website. Uh, we have a guide for dealing with uh, workplace uh, stress and it's 90 pages long and just recently we had a graphic artist who uh, took those 90 pages which were all text and no pictures and put them into a nice colorful 16 page booklet which we affectionately called the mini MIT. MIT is the mental injury tool uh, group uh, that we had put together about over a decade ago to put these tools together for workers. And we have a survey, we have uh, YouTube videos, we have posters and, and cards to help people uh, to do the survey in the workplace. We have a smartphone app uh, you see it here in the upper left hand corner that you can download and you can try it out uh, there also uh, some webinars we have over 50 videos that we've accumulated and pdf versions of the slides on on our mayday mayday uh, website uh, every uh, may we have uh, a series of webinars um, this this year, it will be five webinars starting on April 29th uh, through May, and uh, there will be different topics. And we also have a web app that allows a workplace to set up their own questionnaire and uh, administer it by getting a link that uh, people can fill it out on their computers or their phones or the tablets. And then when you wrap up the uh, survey, it provides you with some results. And those results are compared to uh, uh, a survey that we commissioned ECOS to do in 2019. So we had over 4,000 working Canadians who filled out the survey and you can compare your workplace's results or your personal results um, with that reference data. This is a close up of the cover of the uh, mini MIT or the the 16 page booklet that describes how to work through some of the issues around uh, stress in the workplace. And we use a five step approach. Um, it's uh, learning is the first step. Second is organize. Third is do the assessment Then change is fourth and fifth evaluate whether those changes worked. And we also have two case studies that we work through each of these steps. One is Lucy's story and the other is Stephen's story. 
Lucy's story is a workplace that was toxic uh, when they did the survey. Stephen's story was a progressive workplace that wanted to uh, expand their health and safety uh, horizons to include psychosocial issues. So, uh, and, and both were uh, success stories in the end, although uh, Lucy's story is a little rougher uh, on the way through. And that's what I have for you. And uh, I'd be glad to entertain any questions. And I'll turn it back over to Tiffany uh, to tell me what questions to answer. <laughs> Hi, John. Thank you for the presentation. We just got uh, two questions from the chat here. So the slide, um, all the links and website and tools you share on the slide, uh, are we going to share with the audience here later on? Well, uh, yes, I, I said I would, uh, here they are. Um, Good, uh, I think once I, I PDF the, the slide, um, those P, you will be able to click into each. Yeah, I, I bet yep. because of the M and animation on on these slideshow i i better do the pdf for you and i'll send it to you and you can share that mm -hmm. awesome and then we just got the question from jennifer uh she's saying that uh we are feeling challenged to support our staff without giving them additional work to people we know are already feeling exhausted asking them to do the survey attend this webinar and take time to attend the meditation and good wellness activities. If you're the only one things to better support staff, where would you start? Mm. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's rough because, you know, I personally am feeling that way too. <laughs> Exhausted. Uh, I've been working on COVID issues uh, since the beginning and uh, yeah, what can people do? Uh, I think probably the start, uh, the thing to start with is, is to recognize um, the situation they're in and to ask them, what, what do you need uh, in order to help through? Um, you know, uh, it will be different for different people. Some, pe some people may just need something simple, like some accommodation to deal with uh, issues at home, like, uh, you know, if, if your kids catch COVID and they have to stay home for, uh, you know, how many days, if that's still, <laughs> if that's still a rule there, uh, you know, accommodation for that. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's not one size fits all and you need to uh, interact with the people. Uh, you can't sit in your office and say, we're going to make a policy and this is going to make everybody feel better. You're going to need to uh, step out on the, on the shop floor and talk to people and see what their needs are and how, how can we help? Uh, we all know this is a difficult situation and for some people it'll be one thing for other people it'll be another uh, flexibility, you name it. Yeah. I, I totally agree with you, John. Uh, communication, right? Checking in someone around us. Uh, no matter you are in the workplace or even at home, right? Or in the or your friends, right? So try to step out to kind of talk to each other and see what they need the support. And then we 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 kind of the one we need support and care from 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 others too, not just only we are the one giving out. So I think this is really important uh, how we could supporting each other, you know, how checking in and and communication, talk to each other to to do things. Yeah. I see so, another question there yeah. about uh, the GED 7 and PHQ2 stats. Uh, we actually uh, collaborated with a, a group that was working with the BC Nurses Federation and they had done, they had used the GAD7 and the PHQ9 uh, um, at two times before the pandemic. And then a lot of their members, I think 1,200 of them, uh, participated in our first 
uh, survey. And so we isolated them and they did a fourth uh, survey. So we had four points in time and uh, we published that article and I'll see if I can quickly pick it up so I can share it with you um, in the chat box. Uh, no, that's that, not that one. But um, yes, uh, things, and, and that's what this, the uh, Statistics Canada and the Public Health Agency of Canada studies were showing is things did get worse in during the pandemic. And if anybody has any uh, sympathies for other people, they, they can see that in, in their day-to-day -day, uh, interactions. And uh, let's see, uh, I'm trying to find this, this article. Here we go. Oh, it was, it was three points. It wasn't four points, but I'll, I'll put the link in the chat. Um, but yes, uh, it has been tough. And uh, one, one of the uh, findings of the study in BC was that in, in long-term care, things actually got better. But we're suspicious that what happened there was that there were so many people who worked in long-term care, who gave up their jobs in uh, the beginning of the pandemic because of the, the lack of protections and the poor pay, that uh, you had a whole new set of people uh, that we were uh, surveying later on. And these were people who were willing during a pandemic to come into long-term care facilities to work. Um, I think in a lot of provinces they got extra pay for that too so there was some financial incentive but uh yeah there was such a changeover but for all the other groups of healthcare workers uh things deteriorated thanks john we have another question is how do you get the organization to recognize the levels of concern by the staff <laughs> again uh, just like when you're dealing with individuals, you have to, uh, you know, customize your your interaction to the individual's needs. Different organizations are in different spaces. Um, organizations that have uh, strong commitment to support the individual, um, you know, they they uh, they can deal with these things. But if a, an organization you know just looks at workers as you know replaceable and uh things like that they're going to have a tough time obviously so um how do you get them to change that hopefully uh you know uh for some organizations when when we when we go into workplaces and do surveys i always say there are three types of organizations we deal with um like Stephen's story is a, a progressive workplace that wanted to do something about uh, improving psychosocial conditions, and they were successful. They pulled together, um, and their central issue was trust um, between management and workers. And the way they addressed that was finding new ways of communication and input, uh, getting people input into making decisions and it was is quite amazing how they did that um, in the toxic workplace um, lucy's workplace uh, it things basically had a break before they got better and so um, the the executive dr director uh, resigned and had to resign and also they got rid of the uh, HR director, they brought in new people with a new attitude and um, they sat down and rebuilt their relationship. Now in the, those are the extremes, the very good workplaces and the very toxic workplaces. What I find is it's easy in those types of places, both uh, are interested in change and improvement. One, because they have to, otherwise things will 
fall apart and other ones because they have a desire to, but it's the group in the middle that are, you know, uh, they're sometimes curious as to, you know, what the uh, psychosocial status is, but they're not that strongly motivated to do anything about it. Uh, they're the tough ones to deal with. Uh, so it's kind of ironic because you think usually that the toxic workplaces would be the toughest to deal with, but, you know, they know something has to change soon uh, or else they'll destroy themselves. But uh, the people who who go in it with a half a heart and aren't really committed to making changes, uh, they're the tough ones to, you know, um, either they have to improve so they end up into the progressive uh, type of workplace or they deteriorate until they become in the zone of the toxic workplace and then they have to uh, make changes. Yep, we have no more comments and and question on the chat. So another last check is anyone have the question, you know, please submit on the chat every here. We could able to give you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So the record session and the resources and the PDF version of the slide will be going to send it out to you once this is available. So I got all your contact information. Okay, and thank you also for Any, joining and all yeah. the best in dealing with this because right now we're, we're in a tough time. Yes, yeah. So I think, you know, this is a time we all have to learn to support each other, you know, self-care and also giving out our love and support and be kind for one to another, right? So yeah, thank you all of you to joining the public presentation today. Thank you, John, for giving us the great presentation. So yeah, hope you all stay safe, have a good day and looking forward to a nice spring. Hopefully the spring will be look good. <laughs> so take care everyone, bye-bye.